Thank you, praise team. Beautiful time of uh, worship together. I met a lot of you, uh, my wife and myself, we met a lot of you last week, so some of you may, I may look familiar to some of you, others you may be asking, who is this and where's the pastor? Uh, my name is Ryan Yates, and um, we are, my, my wife Melissa and I and our family are blessed to be here. Um, it's such an answered prayer to be here, and uh, we, are, we are excited to see what God is going to do in our lives through this church, and we're excited to be used by God to serve this church um, as well. So um, our message today, we're going to look at what do we do with God's goodness. Um, we, we sang some wonderful songs that were absolutely true. Uh, we serve a good, good father. We have a, a good father in heaven who cares about us. He is great. Um, but the question that, that I wanted to look at today is, what do we do with God's goodness? But before we get into the word, I wanted to introduce our family a little bit so you'll get to know me a little bit better. So let's look at the first picture up here. There I am on the right. You can see I am a born and bred Texan. There's no doubt about that. Uh, my dad tried to talk me out of that outfit. I said, no way, Dad. If we're going to ride horses, I got I to gotta be dressed like a cowboy. So uh, just let you know where my roots come from. We can go to the next one. Um, here we are moving the last piece of uh, furniture out of the, um, the travel trailer. Melissa and I, we served as missionaries in Eleuthera uh, for about six years. And Eleuthera is an island out in the Bahamas. It's what they call a family island. That means it's not really a, a prosperous island or it's not a wealthy island. It's, it's not the big um, vacation island. It's, it's on the outskirts of the Bahamas, and that's where we served for six years. So this is us moving out there. We said goodbye to our friends and family here in Texas, and we moved away. And let's look at the next, uh, next picture there. There's our first house that we lived in out in the bush. And um, that they, they mowed the lawn, so to speak, for us that when we first moved there. And it kept growing up, and the sand flies were horrible, but it was such a blessing to be there. Um, we were in a hurricane zone. We were actually in the Bermuda Triangle as well. We were in a hurricane zone, and we were living in this wood house. So we were, we were a little nervous about living in a wood house in the middle of a hurricane zone. Uh, we actually went through Hurricane Sandy um, our first full summer there, and it was a Category 2 when it came through. And um, they're horrible. They're just destructive, and they're, they're horrible. But God saw us through it. Uh, he saw the island through it. There wasn't too much destruction. Uh, we were thankful for that. Let's go to the next one. All right, there we are on campus. Uh, Melissa and I served as teachers at a Christian school called Windermere High School. And it was called high school, but we actually taught 5th grade through 12th grade. And um, we served as teachers. We served as counselors. We served as um, spiritual leaders for these children. We, uh, we, we spoke to them during uh, chapels and different, um, different uh, activities that the church or that the uh, school had, uh, uh, sports days and, and cleanups and uh, all that stuff. So that is the boys' dorm behind us right there. There's our family uh, with Isaac and Hannah, the little one in the middle. And um, let's go to the next picture. There is uh, one of our classes. It's actually an after-school program that was called um, Young Life. Young Life is like a youth group ministry if you don't have a church to have the youth group in, if that makes sense. So we had this ministry on campus, and we took them home one day to watch a video, and I think we might have had an ice cream uh, dessert after that. So there are a lot of those kids. I'm taking the picture. Most of these I'm taking the picture. I like to be behind the, ca the camera <laughs> instead of in front of it most of the time. Uh, but that's part of our house as well. So you can see some of our house in there. And in the back is uh, Donna. She is one of the missionaries that we served with. Um, a lot of good kids in that picture. Let's go to the next slide. I'm trying to see if Melissa's crying yet. I already showed her these pictures, so sh she shouldn't be too emotional. All right, there are a few of us up on the roof, or the roof, depending on your pronunciation. Um, we had to paint the roofs every year because of the mildew. The, it's so humid there. Uh, and I'm sure uh, you've experienced something like that as well. It's so humid, the, the water takes so long, or the dew in the morning takes so long to dry. It mildews so quickly, we have to paint the roofs every year. And it helps with leaks, because we didn't have the money to, to for new shingles every year. So there we are doing some work. It was fun. I missed that roof. It was death-defying. You step in the wrong place, and you... We had one guy fall off, and he missed a corner of the... 
uh, sidewalk, co- corner of the sidewalk by about three inches. So God's uh, grace was looking on us that day. All right, let's go to the next one. I'm going through these fast because I want to get to the message, but I also want to introduce us. So we are, we are going to be excited to talk about um, our time in Luther with anyone who has more uh, questions. Uh, this is Melissa in chapel. She's um, teaching the students in chapel. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a small chapel. We had, some years we had about 65 students. Other years we had about 75, 80 students. So it was a small school, 5th grade through 12th grade. Um, but there's a lot of good memories in that chapel. The chapel is in the middle of four rooms, no air conditioning in any of the school rooms. You got fans going, but we always had a teacher, the principal, or someone would always want to turn the fans down because it was so loud you couldn't hear. So it was, it was a big adjustment to get used to that heat and just realize that you're just as sweaty as everybody else is, and that's okay. I don't have that problem this morning. My fingers are cold, and I love it. So, all right, next picture. All right, there is our gas station and grocery store. A lot of people want to ask, what's a grocery store look like? Well, it looks like a gas station because that's that, that was our grocery store and gas station. There was a bigger grocery store way up north that looked like what you and I consider a grocery store. It wasn't as big as Brookshire Brothers or... Walmart or um, Kroger, but it, l- it had the aisles, and it had frozen sections, li- and so it looked familiar, but this was our grocery store a lot, and other ones like it. Think of a convenience store about that size. That's what our grocery store looked like, and things were very expensive there because you have to pay the, the people that are buying the goods to sell. They're buying the goods from the U.S. normally, and they're shipping them over, so they're paying retail price, then they're shipping them over, paying for the shipping, then they have to pay about 40% of, custo- 40% of the value as a customs tax, and then they have to make some money off of it, so they have to up the price. So uh, things are very expensive to buy um, in Eleuthera. Um, but there's our gas station, and uh, John, Miss John, Hannah would always say, hi, John. He was the gas pump. You don't pump your own gas in Eleuthera. Uh, there are attendants that pump it for you. All right, next picture. All right, there are some of the missionaries, not all of the missionaries that we served with, but there are some of the missionaries that we served with. Um, So much fun to serve alongside people that have a heart for God's uh, grace uh, and to see that um, in other people's lives and to serve others that, that, that need help. As I'm sure, as we've heard so much that this church does so much about, that's one thing we're so excited about is to see God moving in this community uh, through this church. Um, a lot of families there, a lot of, a lot of good memories, a lot of good folks. We still have four families and, f- and, f- and, uh, and, and some single missionaries, some family missionaries, but we have still uh, some friends that are still serving there, so they're heavy on our hearts um, all the time. They're, they're in church this morning right now. They're, they're in the middle of church just like we're in the middle of church, so uh, thinking about them. All right, next, next uh, picture. All right, here is the children's church in our home church. So on the island of Eleuthera, we lived in the town called Palmetto Point. And Palmetto Point is called Palmetto Point because there, there were a lot of palmetto uh, palm trees or palm branches. They're the short ones, so they called it Palmetto Point. So here's our church, uh, Palmetto Point Gospel Chapel. And there is the teacher, uh, Sister Lee, uh, in her beautiful hat, and then uh, the, um, the children's church. And... Uh, Isaac and Hannah are missing, missing their friends. She, Hannah would just be in charge. She would have everybody lined up on the row, giving them their Bibles, telling them where to sit and what to do. So she helped Sister Lee a lot. All right, next. Let's look at the next picture. There is the church, and it was hard to get one picture, so it, 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 there's the church. On the left, uh, with the red roof, is uh, the sanctuary. Um, it's about maybe half the size of this, uh, this room right here. And then on the right side, on the bottom, that is our fellowship hall with a kitchen. Um, not every church has a fellowship hall with a kitchen, uh, but ours did. And then on the top of that is the apartment where we lived for the last year uh, while we were there. We lived in that yellow house for about five years, and we lived up here for about one year. And it was about 650 square feet. So we got really close as a family. We really did. But you, you could always go downstairs if you needed a breather, needed to get away or something. Um, and then we had that porch out there, and uh, there was a basketball field, a basketball court. There was a, uh, a softball field right by us. There was a little place down the street where Isaac would go get freeze pops. And freeze pops is a lady makes super, super strong Kool-Aid, pours it in a cup, and she 
freezes it and sells them for a quarter. So he loves that. All right, let's go to the next one. And there is most of our church family, or a lot of our church family, a lot of our consistent church family. The last Sunday that we had, uh, there are our uh, church family in Palmetto Point. We miss them, and we're praying for them, and they're praying for us. They miss us, and they're excited for us, and we miss them, and we're excited for what God's doing. Um, Brother Garth was our, was our lead pastor. He's the second from the left over there. Uh, okay, I think the next one might be our last one. And there's the last picture that we had uh, as missionaries in Eleuthera. W- the airplane in the back was the day we were flying out. And we missed that place uh, so much. But we, we moved our family there because we felt God calling us to go there to serve. And we moved back to Texas because we felt him calling us back to, to move here and serve. And God opened up this opportunity in this church. Uh, Pastor Brian and I have been talking and we met with um, quite a few uh, of the leadership and, and interviews and the meeting most of you, uh, get to know you so much more, and we're so excited for what God is doing. So uh, that's enough for me. Uh, before we open God's Word, would you bow with me and pray as we uh, get ready to look at, look at His book? Uh, Father God, I ask that you would, uh, you would help us to focus on your Word this morning, that you would open up our hearts, that you would open up our, uh, our minds, that you would give us your wisdom and understanding as we as we read your scripture, Father God. Help us to understand what your word says so that we can make it a part of our lives. Uh, give us a humble heart this morning so that you will change us and that we will be receptive to where you lead us, Father God. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, open your Bibles if you have your Bibles today. Some people have Bibles on their phones. Some people have Bibles on tablets. Some people uh, use the Uh, screens for the scripture. We will have scripture on the screens. Uh, But if you have your Bibles, open your Bibles. And you can go ahead and open up to Ephesians chapter 2. And uh, we're going to look, we're going to get in the airplane figuratively, and we're going to look at at the picture of God's goodness that we see in scripture. What I mean also by that is we're not just going to sit in one book of the Bible. We're going to we're going to jump around a little bit, and a lot of times I don't like to do that. I like to, I like to sit and look in, in one piece of scripture, but, but the way God uh, was leading me in this message, it just didn't happen like that. So we're going to be flipping back and forth. If you have your um, note, uh, your uh, bulletin, I have to remember what that is because we didn't, we didn't have them in a Luther, so I have to remember bulletin. If you have your bulletin, you can take notes. The scripture's there, or the scripture will be on the screen. What do we do with God's goodness? I would... I would guess that most of us in here believe God is good. Um, it's foundational for our lives as Christians to acknowledge and, and believe that God is good. And if you're sitting in here this morning and you don't have a relationship, you haven't put your faith in Jesus Christ, then I invite you, I'm praying for you, I have prayed for you, people have been praying for you that, that God will speak to your heart today, that you will see He is good, and that you will want to, um, you'll want to put your faith in Him as your Savior. But what do we do with God, God's goodness? So here's where this message came from. We can go to the next slide. Um, Proverbs 11.27. And you may think, hey, I just heard about this a few weeks ago. Well, I started getting Carol signed me up, or Brian asked Carol to sign me up for the uh, church email. So I've been getting Brian, uh, Pastor Brian's emails. Um, and I was getting his email, and I was reading through the scripture uh, of the emails of his sermons, and, and I came across this one. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, or could be goodwill, but evil comes to the one who searches for it. If, you're gonna, if you look for good, you're going to find goodness, you're going to find favor, but if you're looking for evil, you're going to find it. And um, I'm sure Pastor Brian went over this, but, but when, I, when I read this in my email, I stopped on that word good, and I was like, who... What is good? Who says what's good? We live in a society uh, right now where good is whatever you say it is. And your good may be different from someone else's good. But when we open scripture and we see that word good, uh, what, is that, what does that word really mean? What, what do we think of when we think of that word good? Um, in Genesis 1, at the creation of the world in verse 4, God has created the world. He's looking at it. He, cre- he decided to create light and he spoke it into existence. In Genesis 1, verses 1, 2, and 3. And then verse 4 says, And he looked at the light, and he said, It is good. 
And that is the very first time in Scripture we see God declaring something good. What we need as Christians to understand, well, let me give you the answer to the question. What do, what do we do with God's goodness? Here's the answer if you're taking notes. I don't want to wait till the end because I might get going really fast and try to squeeze something in. I don't want to miss this. The answer is we need to recognize and acknowledge that God is good. And then we need to do God, what God wants us to do. We need to do His good. We need to act. We need to live according to His goodness. We need to abide in God's goodness. We need to acknowledge it, and then we need to do it, whatever He says. And then the third thing is we need to teach His goodness to others. So there's the answer if I start going way too fast. And if, I, if I'm going way too fast, I need to learn to slow down, I will. Um, I tried really hard to avoid a Texas accent when I was in Eleuthera because they couldn't understand me. But I'm so excited this morning, and I'm back in Texas, and I'm just letting it fly. So if you can't understand me, just grab me by the shoulder after the service and say, slow down. Or you can just wave your hand and say, could you repeat what you said? It won't bother me one bit. Um, okay, Genesis 1-4 is the first time God tells us what is good. What we need to understand is, is this goodness that comes from God, it is his excellence, it is his glory, it is his holiness, it is everything about God that is good. And if we have faith in Jesus, we believe that. And if we don't, if we haven't put our faith in Jesus, maybe you don't believe that yet. I pray that you will. We need to see it, we need to recognize it, we need to know it, we need to believe in God's goodness, we need to believe that God is good, and we need to submit to his goodness. Let's go to the next um, scripture. And just in case you were confused, I wanted to look at this very briefly to show you what Jesus thought of his Father in heaven. Now this story comes from Mark chapter 10. It's also found in Luke and it's also found in Matthew of the rich young man or the rich young ruler who comes to Jesus. And he comes, uh, Mark 10, verse 17 and 18. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and he fell on his knees before him. It's a sign of submission to authority. He said, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And instead of answering his question, he, he asks him a question. You know, have you ever noticed how many times Jesus answers a question with a question? He says, he comes to him, he bows to him, he is submitting to him, he calls him good teacher. He is acknowledging this prophet that is before him is from God. And he says, Jesus says to him, he sa or the, the man says, um, what must I, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, why do you call me good? He wants to get this guy on the same page. He wants to make sure before he speaks, this man is listening to the authority that Jesus is speaking with. Why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Jesus is not saying, I'm not God, why are you coming to me? He's not saying that. Jesus is announcing his authority that him and God are one. And he is telling this man, do you know who you're coming to? No one is good except God alone. So you call me good teacher, you're bowing before me, you're asking me this question. When I give you this answer, you need to listen up because I'm speaking with authority. And we see that authority in Matthew 28 in the Good Commission. He says, I ha God has given me all the authority, now go and make disciples. And we know that through the answer Jesus gives this man, he is speaking with that authority. So Jesus is making sure that this man, he's making sure that us this morning, I'm putting my foot up here, I don't know, it feels comfortable, sorry. Um, Jesus is making sure we know this morning that God is good. And and God alone is good. It almost brings us back to Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 and Jeremiah 19. God alone is good. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. He, he, is, he is making sure this man understands that what he's about to say comes with authority from the goodness of God, from the grace of God and the mercy and the love and the excellence of God. So what do we do with God's goodness? We recognize it. That's what... I wanted to show you in Proverbs 11:27 in Genesis and in Mark chapter 10 that we need to recognize God is good. But then what do we do after that? Let's go to the next verse. 
what do we do after that? Well, sorry, you can stay right there. I wanted to tell you this. In uh, Proverbs 11.27, whoever seeks, uh, whoever fervently seeks good, finds good. That word good is the exact same word in the original language as Genesis 1.4. So our scripture is connected, church. It is, it is together. It is cohesive. Whoever seeks the good of God will find favor. All right, so now we can continue. Um, what happens... Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. What happens when we don't seek God's goodness? When, when, uh, when Paul begins chapter 2, I'll start reading in verse 1. I'm going to go all the way through uh, verse 10. As for you, he says, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. What happens when we're not seeking it? What happens when we don't acknowledge God is good? We're dead in our sin. Before we knew Jesus, we were dead in our sin. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world. We were dead in our sin, but by the mercy and grace of God, he saved us, not by works that we did. So let's pick it up in verse 8. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. It is not by works so that no one can boast. So the good that God has given us, we did not earn it. The grace and mercy and love and salvation, the forgiveness of our sins, we didn't earn it. So when we ask the question, what do we do with God's goodness, we need to make sure we're not trying to earn his love because he's given it to us freely. And we can see that in Jesus Christ. It is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is a free gift to you and me. But what do we do with it? For we are God's handiwork. We are God's creation. We are created in Christ Jesus. And here's what we do with it. We're created in Christ Jesus to do good works. Works. God's good works. And what are these good works? God prepared, prepared them in advance for us. He has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And it's going to look different. We, all, we are all made up into the body of Christ, and we all have different gifts. I know Pastor Brian has been sending out an email about learning your spiritual gifts, and that's very important so that we can know the best way to serve the kingdom of God, to serve our church and to serve our community and to serve the nations. We were dead in our sin. We were made alive in Christ. That is God's goodness. He gave us Christ. That is part of God's goodness. Now, what do we do with it? We love him. We put off our old self, we put on our new self, and we love him more than anything. We do his good works. Let me give you the other side of that. I don't have these scriptures on the screen. If I go too fast, I'll, uh, you can grab me after the service and I'll tell you them. What happens if we don't seek God? The answer is, woe, but it's W-O-E. In Isaiah 5.20, woe to the person that exchanges good for evil and evil for good. Or woe to the person that calls good evil and evil good. Woe to the person that calls what is bitter sweet and what is sweet bitter. Woe to the person who has exchanged God's definition of good for evil and evil for God's definition of good. Woe means God's judgment and God's wrath. That doesn't mean that we are sentenced to judgment every time we sin. This is talking about if we do not submit to Christ, if we do not have a relationship with Christ, we are facing God's judgment. But for those who believe, we have new life through a new birth and the Spirit in us. What do we do with God's goodness? We recognize it, we acknowledge it, we submit to it, and then we go out and make it a part of our lives every day. We don't just make it a part of our lives. How God's goodness to change our lives completely. Romans 12, 1 and 2, Paul says, Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice. Put your body on the altar of God. Give yourself to God. And he will transform you. Don't act like the sinful world anymore, but allow yourself to be changed and transformed by God. What do we do with God, God's goodness? We recognize it, 
and then we live it. What happens if we don't? Romans 1.25, Paul tells us, if you're not worshiping God, you are worshiping something else that's not God, and his wrath and his judgment will come on us. Again, Paul is explaining at the first of Romans, we're not being judged and condemned, and we're not facing God's wrath if we sin once. That's not what he's saying. He's saying if we continue to reject Christ, if we continue to deny Jesus as our Savior, then we are facing his judgment. What's, what's uh, one last thing we can look in the Old Testament? What happens when we don't acknowledge God as good? In the book of Judges, the book is a tragic book. Israel is rejecting God as their king. And they're telling the prophet, we want a king like all of the other tribes and people around us. And the prophets are saying, but God is your king. And they say, no, we want a person. In the book of Judges, it ends uh, in chapter 17 and chapter 21. It says, in those days, Israel had no king, and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. So we need to take a minute and reflect are we acknowledging our good, good father as our king? Are we acknowledging, are we living as though Jesus is our Lord? Or are we living as though we have no king and we can do whatever we want? What do we do with God's goodness in our life? We recognize it, we acknowledge it, we submit to it, and then we live it out. Scripture tells us, find out what pleases God and do it. We live to please God, not to earn his love, but because we love him. Because he has given us Jesus, because he has given us grace, because of his mercy and salvation. Now, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, because Christ died for you, now you can live for him. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, if you want to follow me, you have to deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow me. It is this image of putting ourselves away, putting our ideas, our, our, our ambition, putting, putting our sinfulness away and turning and walking after Christ, following him, following his example, letting him lead our lives. That is what I mean when I say we do God's goodness. We put it into action in our lives. And lastly, as we close this morning, in Titus 2, 11 through 14, what do we do with God's goodness we teach it to others. In the middle of this book, Paul is writing a letter to his dear friend who he's sending to an island called Crete. It's right off the coast of Greece, and it's still there. And there are churches, there are groups of Christians around this island, and Paul has sent Titus to this island to help them with their leadership in their church. So that the, the liars who are calling themselves Christians but not, aren't really Christians, they will be either saved or they will be run off so that the Christians will not be led astray into sin anymore. So that's in the middle of this letter, this is the encouragement that Paul gives Titus. He says, he, he gives a short gospel message. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And it teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, God, upright and godly lives in this present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who loves us and gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness, from all unrighteousness. And here's what Jesus is doing, Paul says. He has purchased us. Right? You, you remember the scripture, we are, we are not ourselves, we have been bought with a price. He gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people. Those are Christians, that's us, who have faith in Jesus. He is purifying us, who are his very own, eager to do what is good. Church, I pray as you live your life and you, and you wrestle with temptation and, and you feel God's strength to say no to temptation and yes to his righteousness, not because you're earning his love, but because you love him more, that you are, that I am, that we are eager to do what, his, what is good.
God was with Adam and Eve in the garden. He was in the midst of Adam and Eve in the garden. Then, then sin came in and he left them. Fast forward, he is in the tabernacle with uh, Moses and the Israelites after, after their um, exodus from Egypt. And fast forward, he's in the midst of them in the tabernacle. Fast forward, they build him a permanent temple. So now he's in the midst of his people in the temple. And then the temple gets destroyed. And then there's 400 and something years of silence from God. No prophets, no nothing. And then God sends Jesus to be in the midst of the people of the earth in human form. But then Jesus dies on the cross. And he is, he is raised to new life. And now he goes to heaven and sends us one who is like him, the counselor, the Holy Spirit. Church, God is dwelling on this world through Christians. We are God's hands and feet reaching out to the nations on this world. Let us be eager to do what is good as we carry Jesus wherever we go. What do we do? What do we do with God's goodness? We recognize it. We acknowledge it. We live it. We make it a part of our lives. We make it our entire life, and then we teach it. Let's look at the last verse for this morning, verse 15 in Titus. These, then, are the things that you should teach. Ephesians 6, 4, Father's Day. Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, teach your children in the ways of the Lord. Deuteronomy 6, uh, 4 through 9 Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These, are so, these commands that I'm giving you, Deuteronomy tells us, are supposed to be on our heart. And the very next verse says, impress these, teach these to your children. Talk to them when you wake up, talk to them about them when you wake up and when you go to bed. When you're in the car or walking on the street, put them on the doorpost of your house. Uh, decorate your house with God's word. Church, let us be eager to do what is good and let us teach God's goodness to those around us, to our children, to our grandchildren, to our neighbors, to our community. Let us teach God's goodness to the nations. Let us be obedient to Christ when he says, go into all the nations, teaching them to obey what I have commanded you. The question I want to leave you this morning is, what do we do with God's goodness? We recognize it, we acknowledge it, we submit to it that we are not good on our own, but that it is God that is good. And then we abide in God's goodness. We live according to his goodness. We look at this Bible and we love this Bible and we want to do what it says, not because we're afraid of hell, but because we love Jesus more than anything. And then lastly, we teach it. We're letting God's goodness overflow. We're letting that gospel message, we're letting Christ overflow from our hearts into the lives of the people around us. And if, we, if everyone around us is already saved, then we go find people that aren't saved. And if everyone in our community knows Jesus, we go find people who don't know Jesus so that we can tell them about our Savior who is so good. Let's pray. Father, I'm overwhelmed by your goodness. I'm excited by it. I am a boiling pot of water, and the steam is just coming off you. You are so good, Father God. We love you so much. Father, open our hearts to your word. May, may you preach a sermon in our hearts that is so, so much more important than what was spoken this morning. May you change our lives. Give us humble hearts to be open to your word, open to your leadership in our lives. Give us a love and a desire to see your goodness, to live according to your goodness, and to teach your goodness to others. And Father God, if there are those in this room right now that do not know Christ as their Savior, that have not put their faith in him, squeeze their hearts right now, Father. Have someone be sensitive to them. Have them talk to someone. Have someone reach out to them this morning. Don't let them go another minute without Christ as their Savior. Father God, we love you so much. We thank you for your son. It's in his name we pray. Amen.